Welcome to SciShow Tangents, the lightly competitive science knowledge showcase. I'm your host, Hank Green, and joining me this week, as always, is science expert Devoki Chakravarti. Oh, me. I was not ready for my <laughs> debut. Yes, <laughs> it's me. You know what the word always means. And our <laughs> yeah. resident everyman, Sam Schultz. Hello. So Deboki is here. Deboki's always helping out behind the scenes, making things work. But, but Deboki is also a podcast host in her own right of, with a podcast called Tiny Things. Tiny Matters. Frick. Frick. Yeah. <laughs> oh, Tiny Matters. I actually matters. had this conversation with someone else where they also thought it was called Tiny Things. And they were like <laughs> looking it up and they were like, I can't I find, can't it. find and it. it. So now I feel like mm. we might need to change the name to Tiny Things. Or you just have to buy that website too or whatever. Get your <laughs> SEO yeah. going. Tinythings.com. Yep, sure. I wonder what it is. Oh, what if they sell tiny things? It's not available. <laughs> It'd be cool if it was tiny things, though. Yeah. It's good to have a little, some small stuff around. That way you can leave it in places at, gr- at the grocery store and people find it. What's, is there like, your phone number in it or your address? Or they, they just get to keep no, it? No, just find a tiny thing. There also is not a tiny things podcast. There are small That's things. That's amazing. Little things, but no <laughs> tiny things. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, people just haven't gotten small enough yet. They're just not ready for that next step <laughs> no. to go from small to little to tiny. Yeah. <laughs> like, I care about small things and I care about little yeah. things. I don't, can't really get on board with tiny things. No. No. As far as matters go, we're there. <laughs> yeah. But things, yeah. not quite. I think if anybody can sell the world on tiny things, it's the bookie Chakravarti. That's what I'm here for. That's right. But that's not what we're talking about today. Can I ask a question? <laughs> okay, yeah, sure. What's cold fusion? What's happening? <laughs> it's not cold fusion. It's just fusion. Um, oh, so fusion we've been able to do for, for, a, for a while. Cold fusion is specifically the idea that you could do cu- fusion without heating stuff up a lot, mm-hmm. which sounded nice, but was a fraud, it turned out. Mm-hmm. Oh, shoot. Okay. And what, what we've got going on at the National Ignition Facility is beyond just fusion. So if, like you can do fusion in a lot of different ways, but you have to dump in a lot more energy than you're going to get out. What they have achieved at the National Ignition Facility is that they, uh, they dump a lot of energy into this pellet of fusion fuel, which is just like isotopes of hydrogen. Uh, and that made fusion happen. And that resulted in more energy being released than was put into the pellet. And that's a very, never been done before, and it's a very big deal. You know, it, it, as far as like commercializing that technology, turning it into something that would be valuable to, uh, to, to like generate electricity with, not what this is designed for. Um, mm. But okay. it is definitely proof that it can be done. And there are a lot of experiments going on, both in the private sector and uh, government work, to get to get closer to having this. More, more power coming out of fusion reactions than going in. And it, it seems like that's going to be stories that we're going to be hearing a lot of in the next 10 years. It seems like we're finally at a place where we've got the materials, the software, the understanding um, sort of all lining up that maybe someday before I die, we'll actually have commercial fusion power. Okay, so it's going to only be as soon as, like the soonest it could be is right before you die. It's not going to be imminent. <laughs> yeah. That's, it's not imminent. It's not within Shoot. 10 okay. years, but it might okay. It might be within 20, which All is right. the first time I've ever felt like that could be a thing in my life. So my Oren's life. first car is going to be a, a fusion car. I very much doubt, though uh, who knows, okay. that they would be portable. Yeah, what would that look like? Like, is there just a fusion plant that's delivering power? Is it something that can be made into, like, a battery I don't, I don't know. Def- I don't know. Definitely in the beginning, it's going to be heating up power to make steam. Well, I guess not definitely, but very likely it's going to be heating up power to make steam in a giant power plant that's centralized because it is very complex. And so you wouldn't want to have lots of them. You would want to make as few as possible. But who knows? Mm. Okay. Mm-hmm. I understand completely now. <laughs> we're gonna change the theme at the last minute now yeah, for a yeah fusion yeah. episode fusion now. or whatever yeah but that's so that's not the topic of today's episode <laughs> every week here on SciShow tangents we get together to try to one-up a maze and delight each other with science facts while also trying to stay on topic if you notice my voice sounding weird i kind of do because i've made uh, so many side shows today <laughs> <laughs> feeling rough uh, but our panelists are playing for glory and also for Hank Bucks, which I'll be awarding as we play. And at the end of the episode, we're going to have a winner. But before we get to that, we're going to introduce this week's topic with the traditional science poem. This week, it's from Deboki. It's been four months since I've seen my cat, 
I wonder if he still knows who I am and that I left and that I like to pet his nose. Aww. The signals running from his brain have so much work to do. They help him find the best place to sleep and keep track of time for food. <laughs> but his head is full of so many fears. I wonder if there's space for neurons that remember me once he sees my face. The most famous song about memory was sung on stage by a cat. Surely mm -hmm. that must count for something. There's nothing more scientific than that. <laughs> <laughs> in a week, I guess I'll know whether I'm in his memory or perhaps he'll scoff and turn his back because he prefers my parents to me. Uh, oh, brutal. The book has been out of town for a long time. Yeah. She's been out of the country for a long time. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, that's what I mean by town. <laughs> America town. <laughs> Just one giant town. You don't think Andrew Lloyd Webber did his research before he he made cats? He looked up cat neurons. He's like, yeah. that's what this, doing... this song is about. Uh -huh. He did a bunch of primary research. He was like, there's not enough known here. <laughs> yeah. I'm Andrew Lloyd Webber. I can fund anything. His yeah. ultimate finding was a cat is not a dog. That was his thesis at the end of, yeah. of all of it. <laughs> <laughs> but the topic for the day isn't cats or cats. It's memory. Uh, Devoki, what is what is memory? That's a great question. There's not a really good, like, specific biological definition that we have mm -hmm. for memory. Uh, yeah. It's very broadly a biochemical way of storing information and then using it sure. later on. Um, mm -hmm. But like, that's also kind of a complicated way to define memory because, you know, there are things like bacteria and plants who like they, they seem to be able to remember certain kinds of things like, you know, environmental stresses uh, that help them respond mm -hmm. and adapt to those, uh, those stresses. But like, they're not doing it the way that we do it. So like, how do we, mm -hmm. how do we conceive of memory actually to shamelessly, you know, self promote on tiny matters. We did an mm. episode about memory. And the main, the thing that I took away from that episode is that memory is a process. Like we like to think of memory as a thing, but really it's more of a, a process. And so we can think about that, like on the neurological level, there are actual signals. Like a lot of it is about the strength of signals between our neurons. And that's a lot of what defines memory, at least as we understand it right now. Um, you can also think of it in the process in vertebrates, at least. Um, there are three main steps that we know of to form a memory. There's first like the actual experience that you have in the world, like you touch something, you hear something, and then you have a short-term memory from that, uh, so, which, you know, just helps you like do things in response to that initial mm. thing that you've sensed. And then there's a long-term memory that might build from there. And that actually gets encoded in your neur neurons and stored so that you can bring it back later on. As a person who makes content and that stays on the internet forever, there is nothing quite so uncanny as watching a YouTube video you do not remember making. Uh -huh. <laughs> Where I'm just like, yeah. Yeah. Did I, I did that. I mean, I was there. Clearly, yeah. <laughs> I was in the room when that was made, and yet yeah. none of that, none of that's in there. So it's disturbing to have to scroll to the end credits and be like, "Yeah, I guess I did. I animated I guess that, that was one. me. Couldn't have guessed that." <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so what's like computer memory? A non-biological way to start information. <laughs> it's the same thing, just change that one word. Okay. Well, yeah. yeah, I mean, like, like the way that Devoki described it was very intentionally to like allow for the fact that plants and bugs can kind of remember yeah. stuff, and and bacteria can kind of remember stuff, and and in that case, yeah, computers can also remember stuff through the programming. <laughs> and, and, the, and the ones and the zeros. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> So what is memory, where did it come from? That word, not the biological activity. Well, luckily, this part is a lot easier to to, to figure out. Um, it's one of those words that we've had for a while because people have needed to remember things for a while. So mm. it comes from the Latin memoria, uh, which means memory, remembrance, faculty of remembering. Um, and so there have been similar words in English and French, Memory, memoir, memoir, and mm -hmm. so on. Yeah, so it's a much more straightforward word than it is a concept. Those Latin guys were just, they were just <laughs> words right off the dome. They had a word well, for everything. I mean, there was, this is the thing. There, there were words before 
Any words that they had a bunch of stuff off the dome, it's because people <laughs> earlier than that had words. No, no. We they just, were just writing and then they were like, oh, I need a word for this. <laughs> hmm. <laughs> okay. <laughs> it's a great word, though. And there's yeah. so there's a bunch of words that come from uh, the same root. Um, one of the ones that I like the, the most is mourn, which is from the same oh. root as remember. Oh. Um, hmm. Which makes sense. And that brings us to the beginning of the part where you can earn points. It's a quiz portion of our show. This week, we're going to be doing a truth or fail. One that wasn't written by DeVoe. Sari wrote this one. <laughs> hey, we're not because... supposed to admit that, okay? Thank you, right, all of them. I think we're slowly admitting it. <laughs> I think that we're at the good... I would hate to be taking credit for all of this. <laughs> At um, some point, I'm going to just ask for a title change. I'm going to be the game master. Of <laughs> oh, that's a good one. I like that. Today, yeah. that episode came out where we played all the games that you were on. And some people in the comments were like, Deboki's the secret puppet master of SciShow Tangents. <laughs> yeah. 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 <laughs> it's true. <laughs> so one of the, uh, the most weirdly intense forms of memory is imprinting which is basically when a young animal sees or hears something and then recognizes and prefers that thing. Usually it's one of their parents who gives them food and teaches them how to survive. So here are three stories about visual imprinting in baby birds, but two of them are fake and only one of them is real. And you have to figure out which one is the real one. So is it fact number one? Peking ducks generally imprint on whatever they first see as their mother, and they follow her around. But a 2016 study found that each eye stored visual memory in a different part of the brain, and those parts can't quickly communicate with each other. So if they only imprinted on their mom with their left eye, and then that eye was covered, they wouldn't be able to use the right eye to remember or recognize her. But it might not be that fact. It might be fact number two. In 1982, there were an estimated 24 wild California condors. So researchers stepped in to help breed and raise the chicks. So to make sure the condor chicks didn't imprint on humans, they crafted wrinkly, lifelike puppets of condor heads that covered their arms and fed and raised the hatchlings. But that backfired when it was time to leave the nest. The researchers had to stage elaborate fake funerals to get the chicks to leave their puppet parents behind and fly off on their own. Oh my God. But that might be a lie. It might be fact number three. The last remaining Siberian cranes breed in northeastern Siberia, and they spend their winters near Poyang Lake in southeastern China. When they hatch as chicks, they imprint on one of their parents to learn how to survive. But right before their first winter, they undergo adolescent imprinting, where they follow different leaders that break from the flock into subgroups and glide and rest together along their 5,000 to 6,000 kilometer journey. We don't understand how this memory reboot and reprioritization works, but the clock is ticking to learn. So it might be fact number one, peaking ducks form different memories with different eyes. Fact number two, California condor researchers had to stage elaborate puppet funerals. Or fact number three, Siberian cranes go through adolescent imprinting before they migrate. I just can't think that the two different eyes thing, that they would last very long. That seems like a bad idea. Seems like a bad, bad design. (laughs) Well, there's no designing, is what we always say in there. But it, it also seems... Like it would be hard to survive. Yeah, that seems (laughs) stupid even for a duck. (laughs) Well, I mean, look, you don't usually have to have this problem because you're usually seeing mom with both eyes. What if you're laying down and then you're on a pillow? (laughs) You got your head in a pillow? Yeah. (laughs) The first time you ever wake up. pillow? I think that would be tough for the peeking duck. I'm not buying it. Nice try, Siri. (laughs) I feel like, I mean, I feel like I've heard of people needing to do, like, you you know, they're like the pandas, like the the keepers who wear the panda suits for the panda babies. I don't no. know if that's about imprinting or just not making them deal with, I don't know about like, this. Deal with, deal with people. Yeah. yeah. Oh. oh, you've never seen a human in a panda suit? No. I mean, I have, but not to do. Not with in that pandas. context. Yeah. Just <laughs> maybe, maybe for day. other reasons. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> now I hope I'm not making this up, but I'm pretty sure. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, but that sounds like, that sounds real, right? That sounds like something that a bird would be like, that would, a bird would need to see. 
birds are yeah. very they're very particular I suppose. yeah i don't want to i don't want to leave my parents behind yeah but the last one's kind of boring and so the last one makes me think it's real just because it's a little bit boring but it's like they meet like a cool new dad is that basically what's happening <laughs> They get a cool new dad, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Their stepdad. <laughs> <laughs> They're like, I've imprinted on my parent. And then it's like, not anymore, which yeah. is kind of how we work. Yeah, yeah exactly. Who did, you imp- who did you imprint on when you were a teenager? The Strokes. The band, the entire band, The Strokes. <laughs> That's why I started smoking and why I still wear a, um, why I still wear a jean jacket. I never smoked mom and dad. That's not true. I made that part <laughs> <laughs> well, I can confirm that Sam never smokes now, at least. <laughs> uh, Deboki, who did you imprint on as a teen? Probably Avril Lavigne. Did you ever oh, wear a tie wow, yeah. over a t-shirt? Avril I Lavigne almost style? definitely wore a tie over a collar shirt, okay. but not a t-shirt. Okay. That'd wow. be, that's, that's a little rough. I would, I mean, <laughs> imagining teenage Deboki in a tie and a t-shirt is hilarious. <laughs> yeah, it's <was> pretty cool. <laughs> <laughs> it was very cool. I definitely had worse looks, so that would be better than a lot of what I had going on. Uh, I think I'm going to go with yeah. that one, though. I have a good feeling about the Siberian crane okay. stepdad yeah, I was situation. Say that one, but now I kind of I want to spread it out, so I'm going to go with the Condor funerals because, like, if it's not going to be the Siberian cranes, and I just can't think it's the ducks, mm-hmm. I want to imagine Condor funerals. Well, since you're both in. Well, I'll tell you about the uh, structure, the corpus callosum, which placental mammals have. It helps integrate visual sensory information and memory from both eyes in both brain hemispheres. But all other vertebrates, aside from placental mammals, including birds, have more divided brains. What? So at least for a little while, there are two eyes and two separate visual memory banks competing for which is the true information. That's stupid. (laughs) <laughs> and the so the the way to figure this out to really s- describe how this works is from an experiment from 2016. They had ducklings imprint on a red mother duck decoy with their left eye, and they had their right eye covered with a little eye patch. <laughs> no, <laughs> which Sari has written in the notes. I assume. This was very cute. Around (laughs) around three hours later, they took all the ducklings and gave them a choice between a red or a blue mom. If their left eye or both eyes were left uncovered during this choice, they preferred to follow the red decoy uh, because they had imprinted on their red mom and could access that memory. But if their left eye was covered, then they could only see through their right eye and they couldn't access the imprinted memory. And they just like picked one or the other. They picked them at random. So wow. that's real, and they really did that. Little and fools. The ducks, wow. ducks turned out fine. They turned. They grew up okay. Yeah, I I you read a promise whole, that they. Grew I read a up whole okay. history of their whole lives, and <laughs> okay. it was really lovely from start to finish. Oh, okay, they had no bad days. Oh, okay, good. <laughs> that's fascinating because I feel like when I've been looking at animal memory experiments, they're all food related, and I was just thinking about like. That must just be how we test out memories. But no, it can get so much worse. Like we can yeah. just be, we can be. <laughs> you forgot imprinting. your mother. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> they tested a bunch of different conditions, and they uh, all of these pointed to the same results. Uh, the the next weirdest one was they had ducklings imprint on a red mother duck decoy with one eye and a blue decoy with the other. Oh, and don't. those memories they seemed to neutralize each other. So they, uh, they they didn't imprint on anyone and had to re-imprint after they took their <laughs> their eyes their <laughs> eye patches off. Bonkers, it's totally bonkers. As for the other two facts, it is true that they had puppets that looked like the heads and necks of adult birds, and they used it to feed hatchlings. And a 2007 study found that uh, condors fed by real condor parents tended uh, they learned to be more aggressive than the ones that were reared by puppets. That mm. doesn't mean uh, that doesn't seem to affect their survival rate or they're willing to like establish their own lives in the wild. So that's great news, but it is funny that they were able to see a difference. And captive breeding and reintroduction programs have helped boost the total population of California condors to over 500. It's a mix of captive and wild birds. So that's great news. And you are right, Deboki, that they dress up like pandas <laughs> and like condors <laughs> just to, so that they don't like... Imprint, specifically, up, yeah. they don't get as comfortable around humans, I think oh. is the main thing that you 
really don't want them to do. Yeah. But these cranes uh, in Siberia, they do migrate and they are critically endangered. But I don't I think we've ever heard of a bird imprinting more than once. It's pretty much an early development memory learning thing. And it's physically like it's a term for that. So you kind of would have to more loosely define the term in order for mm. this to be a thing. Devious, devious lies. Yeah. Devious lies. So headed into the break with a score of zero to zero. It's an even playing field. We'll see you when we get back. Hey, welcome back, everybody. It's time for the Fact Off. Our panelists have brought in science facts to present to me in an attempt to blow my mind. And after they have presented their facts, I will judge them. I will award them any way I see fit. But to decide who goes first, we're going to do a little trivia question here. So a particularly fun memory study in non-human animals was conducted by a behavioral scientist named John W. Pilly, Piley, with his border collie. So he used his own border collie, whose name was Chaser. She's very cute mm-hmm. and very good scientifically speaking. Starting on June 28th, 2004, Billy gathered a ton of different toys that varied in size, shape, color, material, and so on. And he gave each toy a unique one or two word proper name, like tennis, lion, or Santa Claus. And he wrote those names with permanent marker so that all trainers who worked with Chaser could reinforce the same words. After three years of daily learning and practice, (sighs) How many unique objects could Chaser remember and fetch? Ah, we did a Sideshow Kids about this, and I think it was something um, huge. But we did it like seven years ago, so I don't remember. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I, the first number that popped into my brain was 10,000. That seems crazy. <gasps> I don't even know if I know 10,000 different things, but that's what, that's what I'm going with. Sam's going to go uh, for 10,000. 000- <laughs> Individual unique doggy toys. The the first number that popped into my brain was 284, and I don't know why, but I'm going to go uh, with that. Well, 1,022 <laughs> is closer to 284 oh, than it 10, is 000. to 10,000. <laughs> Shoot. Well, I had to go it's, with my gut. It's, like, it's, it's weird, funny because I, I feel, feel like, like in spirit, Sam was actually I, exa- more correct. Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> like orders of magnitude. Yeah. It's like yeah. much closer, but. It was yeah. 1,000. It was 1,000 in dog numbers, you know. Mm-hmm. <laughs> <laughs> so that means the bookie gets to decide who goes first. Um, I'll go first. So when we get old. We tend to get worse at remembering things, and that's in part because our hippocampus starts to deteriorate. And that's probably a thing that many animals have to deal with as they age, except for the cuttlefish. Cuttlefish, Mm -hmm. it turns out, have very good memories even as they get old. So old in cuttlefish terms is about two years old. They're cephalopods, and we know that they have large brains for their size, so they're pretty smart. And they also have a vertical lobe where much of their learning and memory seems to take place, and it doesn't seem to deteriorate until the last two to three days of their life. So scientists wanted to put their memory to the test using food. They trained the cuttlefish to approach specific spots in their tank marked with black and white flags, and the cuttlefish would get fed one of two things depending on which flag it swam to. Either they got a king prawn or they got what they consider more appetizing, which is a live grass shrimp. The location of these (laughs) flags would change each day of the experiment, Um, so they would have to like basically uh, kind of repeat this experiment each day to to actually put their memory to the test. And so the way that they would actually test this out is there was a morning feeding where the cuttlefish could see the flags and randomly approach one of them, at which point they would find out which flag was associated with each flag prey and they could then choose between them and like pick out you know if they want the the grass prawn or the grass shrimp or whatever and so they they could pick out which food they'd get an hour later there was a second feeding but at this one they would only be fed the king prawn and they would only get it if they swam to the correct king prawn flag and then three hours later there was a third feeding where they could get either the king prawn or the live shrimp depending on which flag they swam to so researchers based their assessment of the cuttlefish's memory on how well they 
were able to correctly guess the king prawn in the second feeding and the live shrimp in the third. Basically, over the course of all of these feedings and all of this like complicated flagging and picking out food, the cuttlefish would need to remember what they had eaten in the morning, where they'd eaten it, and how long it had been since they'd eaten it, mm. which is a lot mm -hmm. of stuff to keep track of and to remember. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> like you were describing yeah, the experiment. I'd be like, I don't remember where I got the beans. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so it's a lot to remember. Like even describing the experiment, I was like trying to remember the details. Like I was struggling and I'm thinking about these cuttlefish who were like doing this day in, day out. And what was wild is the researchers found that there was no significant difference between the 22 to 24 month old cuttlefish. So that's their old cuttlefish and their 10 to 12 month old cuttlefish who are the younger ones um, in remembering all this, which means they're probably pretty good at remembering things. They're better than us, like even in their old age. And there is a caveat that they didn't test out the cuttlefish memory in those last few days of life where their brain is starting to deteriorate. So that mm -hmm. might be where, you know, they start to lose their memories. And the researchers suggested that this good memory it might be related to the fact that cuttlefish mate towards the end of their life. So mm -hmm. like maybe this is part of how they remember like the who, the when, the where of all of their mating choices. They like they might still need to have some memory to be to know that they're right. making good good choices. They gotta make the good decisions up to the last moment. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And then exactly. the, and then they do it and then they're like, I'm gonna die now. <laughs> Thank you. Rip <laughs> to the cuttlefish. I love that they're discerning enough to, to know the difference between those two different shrimps. The yeah, king prawn yeah. looks much tastier than a live grass shrimp to me, but I guess yeah, I'm not a cuttlefish. we're not cuttlefish. So don't we don't have yeah. their discerning palate. You know, the researchers didn't need to figure that out. Like, that's <laughs> something that they've known. They are perfectly aware of cuttlefish preferences for, their for various is. crustaceans. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> Sam, what do you got? A stereotypical boomer thing to say is that kids these days experience life through their phones, taking pictures and recording things instead of engaging with their lives and experiencing things firsthand, remembering things because you live them and not just because you have a picture of them. And geez, grandpa, you might say, what is a picture if not a memory frozen in time perfectly? How does taking pictures of something mean I'm not engaging with that thing? Well, it hurts to say, but in this instance, oh, no. boomers might be right and science unfortunately seems to have their back so in 2021 some findings were acceptable <laughs> science Get on i can't board. believe i'm about to argue that science is wrong <laughs> in 2021 some findings were published of a series of experiments where people walked around an art museum and looked at all the art they were given a camera and told to just look at some of the pieces and told to take pictures of other pieces then 20 minutes after they were done looking around, they were given a test asking them about the physical elements of the work that they looked at, as well as questions about like the meaning and the themes of the work. And then they were given the same test two days later, and both times they weren't allowed to look at their photos. They, they just had to remember all that stuff. And what they found was that people's memories of pieces of art that they took pictures of were way worse than the pieces that they just looked at. And this experiment was conducted three times with some slight variation between 2013 and 2021. And those studies showed the same result. Uh, even versions of the experiment where there were limitations in place uh, with the goal of making people more thoughtful about what pictures they took, like limiting the number of pictures they were allowed to take, had similar results. The researchers suggested that the act of thinking about taking a photo, like figuring out the composition and getting everything just right, becomes the thing that your brain remembers instead of mm. the thing that you're taking a picture of, which kind of makes sense why you don't remember anything from SciShows that you do, because you're thinking about like, yeah. Making a video. <laughs> And if you assume that people are taking pictures mostly of things that they want to remember, that seems bad. And I know that anecdotally, when I go to museums, I take a lot of pictures of art that like that I like or want to copy somehow. Uh, and I both never look at those pictures again, and I couldn't tell you what any of the stuff I took pictures of was. So the advice that the researchers also give is to think about if you're ever actually going to look at the picture you take before you take it, uh, and to just enjoy and soak in the moment if you don't think that you will. But looking at pictures later does help retain memories better. So it's very complicated, but basically you just got to be thoughtful before you do it. So the next time your parent or old relative scoffs and rolls their eyes, when you take pictures and videos of everything, say, okay, boomer, perhaps you are correct. <laughs> <laughs> I like, I want to do this from now on with my parents. I want to say, okay, boomer, you're right. Which it's impossible. Uh, no, it yeah. sounded very. That sounded very aggressive. It's unnatural. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it's unnatural and aggressive. Yeah, they're gonna think you're messing uh -huh. with them. Yeah, 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 for sure. <laughs> it sounds to me though 
like I can still take pictures of stuff, especially if I'm going to look at the pictures, which I, yes, mostly what I don't want is to forget my, like to lose memories of my child. Yeah. Because I take a lot of pictures of my child, but I yeah. look at those pictures. Yeah. Uh, kind of like a embarrassing amount. Like, it's huh. like, I, like, are you obsessed with this kid or something? What's up, Hank? <laughs> Why do you look at this kid? But he's just so yeah. like, oh, look, he's so freaking cute. So but maybe if it's like a sunset, you know, the picture's not going to look as good as a sunset. So maybe you should just right. be like, eh, I'll just look at the sunset instead. But I'm going to put it, I'm going to put it on Instagram though. It's yeah. all, it's, that's a good I, point. I, I remember it. I just <laughs> want, even if it's not I as good as the content. original sunset, it's still pretty good usually. That's I right. guess so. I do appreciate it. Like, I feel like. <laughs> In the moment, I hate taking food pictures. Like when I'm out eating, I feel mm. so self-conscious about taking pictures. Mm-hmm. But when I'm traveling, especially, I like it's actually super helpful for looking back and remembering. Like, oh right, yeah, I had this meal. That like, was this was a good meal. One of the I did. I once when I we went to England, I filmed. I said, "This is our this meal." I did it for every single meal we were in, and then I edited them all together into a thing. And I even now I can go back and watch that video and be like, "That trip, oh yeah, yeah." That was sort of like the outline of the trip. All the different places we were yeah. encapsulated in various pizzas and pastas. <laughs> Look, guys, I didn't do this research, okay? <laughs> <laughs> I think I'm going to go with, I'm sorry, Sam, with Deboki, just uh-huh. because I feel like the scientists worked harder on that experience. <laughs> I don't yeah. know. They they, like the creating the methodology for how to confuse a cuttlefish <laughs> is better than creating a methodology for how to like get people to take pictures or not take pictures in a museum. Both had fascinating, fascinating results. And that means, Taboki, since there were no points in the first round, that you are the winner. Congratulations, Taboki. And we're going to move on to uh, it's the time to ask the science couch where we've got a listener question for our virtual couch of finely honed scientific minds. Sustis Katie asks, why do we sometimes easily remember dumb things like gum commercial jingles and have difficulty remembering meaningful info? I know that there, like, there are things about music that makes it easier to remember. And it's, mm. it's almost like, a t- like I'm fairly certain just from examining my own, the, own, the functioning of my own brain, it's a, it's interesting. I can I can sing a song and listen to a podcast no problem. Mm. But I cannot talk and listen to a podcast. And if the podcast oh, starts yeah. playing music, then I can't sing anymore. Is this something you do a lot? Embarrassingly, <laughs> yes, when I'm okay. singing to my son the night night songs. You have to listen about to about <laughs> a about a 10 to 15 minute process. And I'm like, I can oh. listen to a podcast right now. <laughs> okay. You've like automated the night night song, basically. Yeah. <laughs> okay. yeah. So don't let him know that. <laughs> don't listen to this. Oren, we'll put a warning at the top but, of the episode. Oren, not this one. Never. Never. <laughs> but I just, yes, yeah, so I, I like, I got a lot of, I love listening to an audio book. Uh, well, that is baby one of the things that's involved. Um, so there, I mean, <laughs> like who knows, but yeah. also there's like two general things that maybe are involved with this. So one is kind of the music aspect. Um, there's what we call earworms, but the technical term is involuntary music imagery, uh, I-N-M-I. And there's something that people have been studying for a while because they're like basically common, relatively common involuntary thoughts. And like they've been around for a while, like or like people have been trying to figure them out um, for a while because, yeah, they're weird. Uh, apparently, the term earworm entered the English language around the 1970s from the German word or worm or or I don't know how to say German but oh. or worm um but it's also been called the piper's maggot in older texts which I think oh. is very nice oh, scary <laughs> yeah <laughs> And so they're they're pretty common. There was a, a 2012 study uh, where 12,000 Finnish internet users were asked to fill out a survey, and 89% of them reported experiencing e- earworms at least once a week. Uh, so they're pretty common, and also the, they might make you annoyed. They might be something you hear a lot, so they might trigger some kind of emotional response in you. And that's actually related to the other reason then that these kinds of things might like a jingle might stand out to you, which is um, really kind of the factors that relate to why you might remember something more, especially if you have like a strong emotional reaction to something or something super repetitive. Um, So there are 
two types of memory. There's an explicit slash declarative long-term memory where like that's something that you're trying to actually recall something. Like it might be your friend's birthday or something that like happened recently, but Mm -hmm. there's also implicit or non-declarative long-term memories memories where you're remembering something unconsciously, like maybe because something was playing in the background um, or like if you're an animal like there's a flag that's being waved in front of you you're a cuttlefish you see a flag like that's your your cue like those those are different ways that we might recall memory and so a lot of our thoughts and memories are actually that involuntary and implicit kind and we don't necessarily understand much behind that um, behind why or how this type of type of uh, memory recall works but there's definitely a factor of like strong emotion. So especially for something like a commercial jingle where advertisers are trying to make something that you're going to listen to and that you're going to pay attention to, like, you know, they're going to have branding involved. They're going to try to invoke a specific memory. So that's probably a big part of why you're going to recall it. And then also it's probably going to be repeated a lot. And so that's going to be something that will factor into just the likelihood that you're going to recall something. So those are mm-hmm. those are the big factors the the music and the repetitiveness and the <clears throat> emotional aspect so i just need a professional jingle maker to n- n- just write songs about my friends' birthdays. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, basically. <laughs> well, if you want to ask the Science Couch your question, you can follow us on Twitter at SciShow Tangents, where we'll tweet out topics for upcoming episodes every week. Or you can join the SciShow Tangents Patreon and ask us on our Discord. Thank you to at CrystalR99, James on Discord, and everybody else who asked us your questions for this episode. Deboki, thank you. Where can I go get Tiny Matters? Anywhere you listen to podcasts, look for Tiny Matters, not Tiny Things, Tiny Matters. <laughs> <laughs> and you can also find me on Twitter at okidoki underscore bokey. Uh, and you can also hear her work every week on Tangents and Dear Hank and John. And, John and Microcosmos. And, and, and Journey yeah, to the Microcosmos. The bokey's kind of the secret of power behind the, the whole operation. <laughs> Very busy person. <laughs> if you like this show and you want to help us out, it's real easy to do that. You can go to patreon.com slash scishowtangents to become a patron and get access to a lot. So the thing is, as we continue to make more stuff, there's just more value. You're just getting more and so more get for your money. A real deep well of our bonus episodes and of other weird things we have created over the years. And special thanks to patrons John Pollock and Les Aker. Second, you can leave us a review wherever you listen. That helps us know what you like about the show. I love reading our reviews. And finally, if you want to show your love for SciShow Tangents, just tell Tell people people about about us. 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 Mm. (laughs) Thank you for joining us. I've been Hank Green. I've been Sam Schultz. I've been Devoki Chakrabarty. SciShow Tangents is created by all of us and produced by Sam Schultz. Our associate producer is Faith Schmidt. Our editor is Seth Blixman. Our story editor is Alex Billo. Our social media organizer is Julia Buzz Bazayo. Our editorial assistant for this episode was Sari Riley. Our sound design is by Joseph Tuna Medish. Our executive producers are Caitlin Hoffmeister and me, Hank Green. And we couldn't make any of this without our patrons on Patreon. Thank you. And remember, the mind is not a vessel to be filled, but a fire. thing. There have been a couple viral anecdotes about people getting constipated or taking a giant dump and experiencing what's known as <laughs> transient global amnesia. Which is <gasps> what? <laughs> <laughs> which is we should just do a butt <laughs> podcast. <laughs> 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 so transient global amnesia is kind of you a don't have to t- tell me i know what it is <laughs> it's all I, there yeah <laughs> it's in the name <laughs> continue sorry please tell me what it is <laughs> so transient global amnesia is a kind of catch-all term for a sudden mysterious couple hours long period of memory <laughs> loss usually in middle-aged or elderly people Our best guess as to the science behind potential amnesia poops involves the vagus nerve, which runs all the way from your brain to your large intestine. A particularly large poop getting squeezed out of your body can stimulate the vagus nerve and drop your blood pressure, change oxygen flow to your brain, and cause all sorts of lightheadedness or 
maybe even brief memory problems. Oh my God. <laughs> what on earth? That's the best butt fact you can of have all a time. Poop so big <laughs> that you just that forget. You, forget. <laughs> you just wander off into the wilderness. <laughs> Who am I? <laughs> 